Good evening viewers, welcome to this session of teleconferencing. This teleconferencing session relates to MHI-01 Ancient and Medieval Societies. It's a course for MA students and we have chosen this area for discussion today as you must have seen on your screens, transition to modern world. There has been lot of debates about it that how this process from a medieval society gradually world changes to what is known as the modern world. We have with us two experts today to discuss the issue and respond to your queries and questions or any comments. I have with me Professor Arvind Sinha, he is, teaches at Jawaharlal Nehru University in the, and we have Dr. Salil Mishra, who is a professor of history in Indira Gandhi National Open University. I hope that with these experts with us, you will greatly benefit from their ex expertise and debate can be meaningful. As far as our students are concerned, they are requested to put their questions either in English or Hindi. They will respond to the questions in whatever language the questions are put to us. As you must have studied in your course on ancient and medieval societies that development in ancient and medieval societies were taking place in different parts of the world as per the historical processes and conditions prevailing there. Gradually the world was moving towards a situation where the barriers were coming down and the different societies which were in ancient period in isolation were coming in contact with each other and gradually a new world was taking shape which we call as modern world. So before we proceed further, I would like to put the question to my experts is as to what actually is medieval world and what is modern world. How do we differentiate between the two so that we can take our discussions further. So Dr. Sinha, what do you feel actually how can we define what the ancient world is? Or okay. can we call it a, a ancient or medieval world? Or they are just medieval and ancient societies and when it comes to modern period only then we refer to world as a whole as modern world. I quite agree with you that uh, it is not possible to describe the entire scenario all over the world into one single category and to say that it was the medieval world as such. Uh, there are certain areas which in fact uh, develop faster than the other areas. Every region had its own peculiar characteristics. It had its own understanding. It had uh, the own uh, social level, economic level. So I would say that when we distinguish one region from another or when we distinguish uh, one period with another, then the focus is generally uh, at the economic level. Uh, when we say that it is a medieval world or it's an ancient world, then it is the mode of production in the ancient world which is slavery dominated society that we generally call ancient world. But after development, after growth in production, changes which take place in technology, there is a shift. There is definitely a shift towards medieval world. And what emerges in the medieval world is the feudal society. Now, feudal society has certain characteristics which distinguishes it from the modern world. Number one, that it is a static society. It does not change very fast. And you see the common traits which exist almost throughout Europe, throughout Asia. Uh, although there is a debate that whether the uh, Asian mode of production was uh, different from the European feudal mode of production, there are different answers to it, but uh, in short, one can say that uh, uh, the feudal mode of production, in fact, was a very dominant aspect of medieval life. Then it is also based on agriculture. Agriculture is another very important form, um, and agriculture is 
based on decentralized structure every region is self sufficient we call it natural economy every every area is self sufficient and is based on natural economy it is not oriented to the market the production is for immediate consumption then uh, it also has one important feature and that is it is religion dominated society because when the state when the society is static when there are not many changes taking place and when the pillar of the society is religion then the mentality the the thinking process the traditions customs everything they make a person confined to a small area the, the mental domain is very narrow and he is thinking only in terms of his immediate neighborhood he cannot think because the knowledge does not exist at that level there is hardly any trade there is hardly any scientific development a scientific society cannot emerge in a feudal society because it is governed by a principle of exploitation by the landlords of the serfs so it is a society based on exploitation by the ruling class by the by the land owning class and the other people who are dependent on them the serfs they cannot bring about any change as such so that is the important trait of a medieval society there are many other aspects to it but these are the main ones now coming to what we call modern society now modern society in fact implies lot of things why we call it modern society why the process of modernization because the existing system is not geared to the requirements of the modern uh, uh, social system or economic system so there has there is a need for change and now what is the need of change a shift from feudal mode of production to the capitalist mode of production when we enter the domain of of capitalist mode of production that is the time when we call the emergence of modern world and this process starts from the late 15th century itself and goes on it's a very slow process in certain areas it, within europe there is so much of unevenness there is so much of disparity one region is very is developing faster the uh, other region remains static and th then we also come across in places like central europe where centralization where, where uh, uh, economy is moving away towards feudalism so that region may have may not be under feudal structure at that time but by 16th 17th century uh, a new stage of feudalism develops th that we call the second stage of feudalism Russia retains feudalism right till the 19th century. So within Europe there is so much of disparity. Then when we talk of uh, other regions outside Europe, we find that uh, in uh, American uh, territories, what we call the New World, which consisted of North America, South America, uh, West Indies, there we have uh, 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 very a different kind of civilization which has not even reached the level of feudalism you, we have uh, societies existing in africa which we call tribal societies uh, on the other side asia is fairly well developed region and to a certain extent in the 16th century many parts of asia not many but at least some parts of asia were more advanced than the european societies in certain ways not in every way but in certain ways so what we call modern period when we talk of modern period it has certain traits now what are the traits these are to be located in the economy that it it is market economy it is market oriented economy it is focusing on a uh, large network of trade catering to the demands which are located at uh, great distance and Uh, where the sea trade comes into force it is not that sea trade did not exist earlier in the earlier period in ancient period also there was a lot of sea trading activities but in the modern world the coming of modern world the different continents of the world are now interlinked and the interlinking of various continents by means of trade by means of demand and supply in fact makes the entire world modern Uh, uh similarly the domination of religion declines the 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 secular concept of society or the tolerance level of society although in in the initial 200 years 16 17 centuries were the period of intersign wars among the various relig religions within europe 
leave aside outside Europe. Within Europe, Protestants, Catholics, Anabaptists, uh, they were all fighting uh, wars at different levels. So, but still at the same time, the, these wars ultimately bring about a stage when man starts thinking beyond religion, outside religion. And uh, it is the beginning of the formation of uh, society based on secular outlook. And third important development which takes place is the development of new technology which also gives rise to modern science. It is the rise of modern science uh, in Europe which distinguishes it from the other regions because it leads to, to the domination of Europe over rest of the lands. Now scientific uh, developments were there in China as well. They, there were scientific developments in uh, Arab world as well. They were much advanced till a particular point, till about 14th century. But after that, the progress virtually stopped. Now, it is very difficult to ascribe reasons for it, except that this was the period where feudal influence began to take domination over rationality, over other areas. We will we'll come to that process uh, okay. in a little while, uh, one by one in different sectors. Yeah. Mm. So now in the first section, mm. uh, as Professor Sinha has uh, outlined what are the basic features of a medieval society and what constitutes a modern world. Uh, Professor Mishra, would you like to add something to it? Uh, yes, uh, thank you uh, Professor Khan. I think by now you must have got a fairly coherent idea about what is it that we are dealing with, what is it that we are discussing. And let me just recapitulate, recapitulate very briefly. Firstly, we are dealing with a huge transformation. Uh, when we are talking about a transition, but what we have in mind is a huge transformation in the life of mankind and the nature of transformation is such that it, br it brings about a very, very fundamental change in virtually every aspect of human life, social, economic, political. And this change, this transformation is irreversible. Now, this transformation has been referred to in various ways. It has been called a transition from pre-modern to modern, it has been called a transition from feudal world, feudal society types of societies to a capitalist society. It has been called a, trans, a transition from various types of societies to a society with a capital S. The, in, the implication is that we are now talking about a much a world which is much more integrated, which is much more connected, which is much more interlinked. And I think uh, 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 Dr. Sinha did use the word interlinked. So it is the interlinked nature which makes it a distinct type of world. The other way of looking upon this transition is to look, it, look upon it as a transition from an agrarian society or from agrarian societies to an industrial society. Now, what I am trying to say is that these and various other ways may be looked upon different ways of essentially trying to explain the same phenomenon, this huge transformation that occurs in the life of mankind. That's the first point that I want to uh, highlight, which has been the, the, the various aspects of this transformation have already been highlighted by Dr. Sinha and I do not, I need not go into it. The second major imp a thing is the unevenness of this transformation. There is nothing straight or linear or mechanical about this transition. It is not as if the all of all of the world really makes a transition from one kind of state to another kind of state. At a given point of time. At a given point of time. Mm -hmm. There are diversities of time and space and there are complexities of all kinds. When I say there are diversities of space, I mean the different parts of the world enter into modern world or make their transition to modern world at different points in time. There is a certain process which can be said to have started at around the 15th century as Dr. Sinha pointed out to you, but it starts at 15th century, it continues and different societies join. So it's well spread, it's extremely diverse in terms of time, in terms of space, also in terms of the ways in which Mankind makes this transition from one type of living, from one type of social order, from one type of organization to entirely, qualitatively, fundamentally, irreversibly different type of social order and organization.
So basic transformation and uneven of unevenness of this transformation are two things that uh, uh, need to be kept in mind. What are the, na the, the nature of the two types of societies? is again a very very tricky and a complex subject to handle but I think we can uh, try and uh, at a very simple level we can try and draw a picture of two very different types of societies. We can construct a model of two types of societies. One which may be called an agrarian society and then little later maybe we will try and draw a picture of a modern or an industrial society and then try and show to you the contrast. But that we will do later. For the moment I think uh, I just want to add these two things to what Dr. Sinha said. One is the fact of transformation however we call it from pre-modern to modern, from feudal to uh, capitalist, from agrarian to industrial and many other ways and second is the tremendous diversity and unevenness that accompanies this transformation. Over to Professor Khan. Oh, thank you Sanil. Now I am sure our students will be quite clear about what, how and in what areas this transformation is taking place or this transition is taking place from a medieval world to a modern world. What I would uh, request my experts that we may go now one by one in different uh, spheres of activities or different spheres like polity, society, economy and religion of course which uh, Dr. Sina said played a very important role uh, the changes taking place as medieval society was based on uh, religion and they uh, were drawing for their laws and other things from the religion and how shifts take place in the modern world through secular uh, principles and secular thinking and rationality and all that. So uh, let us start with the political structures. W what was happening in political spheres which we may say that this is the medieval political structure and this is modern. Uh, is it a feudal polity or what is a modern po polity? How are two different? One by one we will move then to society mm. and economy and culture. So Dr. Sina, what do you feel about the political sphere? What changes were taking place? How See, transition? Uh, as I mentioned earlier that medieval society was based on hierarchy and was and this hierarchy was a feudal hierarchy in which uh, the authority was decentralized. The king was quite dependent on his subordinates and even he d and the uh, formation of army etc. was not at the central level but at the local level by the uh, by the local feudal lords. Now in gradually one finds uh, that uh, from the late 15th century a process of centralization taking place and, and the situation is gradually been reversed and by, the, uh, by 16th century we find in certain parts of Europe in fact the major states of Europe start having a centralization of authority which we call the development of absolute power or rise of absolutism. The rulers start dominating the entire society and they try to appropriate not only the surplus but they also make the feudal ruling class dependent on the kings. Uh, now why this change came about, most of the historians argue it's a big debate what led to the rise of absolutism and Perry Anderson is one of the major contributors in this theory. He says that it emerged as a product of feudal crisis. Uh, that the revenues of the rulers were declining, uh, so the revenue of the ruling class was declining and uh, there were constant peasant threats, the population was greatly reduced because of the black deaths in the 14th century and, and as a result the rulers needed, uh, uh, on the one side the kings needed the support of the feudal lords but more importantly the feudal lords now needed the support of the central authority and thereby the rulers began to take powers which earlier were appropriated by the feudal uh, landlords or the feudal lords and we find that a court configuration emerging in, in England, in France, in Spain, in Russia and so many other places, Sweden, so many other places where the relationship is one in which the rulers are now gradually becoming dependent on the king. At the same time it is not a modern structure, it is not a capitalist structure, it remains within the periphery of the feudal order, uh, feudal structure. 
and so a rise of absolutism is generally seen at three ways in three ways one that it was a part of a more developed feudal system secondly it was a period of transition from feudalism uh, feudalism to capitalism where uh, the rulers were in fact acting as a force of equilibrium between the feudal nobility and the rising bourgeoisie and the third view suggests that this was in fact the end of feudal political structure and the emergence of capitalist structure because the rulers now become not only redistributors of income but they are also become the promoters of capitalism so there are various theories which suggest that uh, centralization of authority was related to the crisis of feudalism interestingly this is not a phenomena only confined to europe in asian societies also we have three major empires emerging in uh, in uh, the arab world in india and in china and and the sequence is roughly the same it is the local magnates the local feudal lords are being displaced from the power by the central authority and gradually a court culture emerges which is which is catering which is looking after the entire process of uh, development political development social development it has control over uh, religion in certain places the church comes under the authority of the rulers and so it leads to centralization of or nationalization of church it also leads to uh, uh, an economic structure where revenue system is centralized it also leads to centralization of legal system and so we find that the process of centralization is a principal hallmark of the emergence of modern world especially from the 16th century onwards it's not a uniform process but it is a trend which is noticeable almost everywhere dr mishra uh, would you like to add something to this uh, <clears throat> uh, yes not very much but i think what has become very clear is that uh, the major transition in polity if we were to understand that in one word that one word would be centralization that a number of things are happening there are a number of factors which make this centralization inevitable and this centralization is not just of political authority this centralization of is 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 visible at various levels legal centralization uh, creation of new empires do we do we notice the emergence of large armies also during this period definitely that, that definitely uh, now uh, the central authority central not only uh, armies but also bureaucracy yeah, yeah. so bureaucracy so. army legal system power a certain centralization uh, takes place i think one feature of and i am anticipating some of the discussion which is going to take place but i hope it will put the uh, f the discussion will fall into perspective one way in which lot of these changes politics we have discussed economy and uh, society and religion we are going to be discussing uh, shortly one way in which uh, lot of these things make sense in the modern world is their mutual interconnectedness what happens is that uh, uh, from the 18th century onwards a new type of a very entirely a new type of economy takes place a new type of economy emerges which is based on the idea of growth principles of growth application of science and technology to production processes now this also makes it necessary to have a new type of political structure a new type of state earlier types of state systems are simply not capable of catering to the new type of economic developments so the new type of state system which follows the empires that dr sinha talked about are nation states which are a they are representative they are secular they are interventionist they are in some ways more coercive and they are not somehow outside the society they are they have the society fully under their control they are fully interventionist and coercive and centralized at the same time a new type of society or a new type of social structure also emerges now this new type of social structure is marked by a tendency towards secularization a tendency towards urbanization a tendency towards atomization or individualization a tendency towards an increase in disenchantment with religious authorities and with earlier forms of authorities so the three types of changes the three clusters of changes economic based on growth 
political based on a new type of state emerging which is representative coercive centralized nation national and a new type of social structure which is based upon urbanization atomization atomization secularization and so on so these three are actually interconnected with each other they don't stand outside each other and this interconnectedness of the polity with economy and society this is really the hallmark the defining feature of the new type of society of the new type of world that emerges from 18th century onwards why this world emerges we are already beginning to get some glimpses on the basis of what dr sena said maybe we can now i would uh, hand over to professor khan so that he can then initiate the discussion on various other aspects along with political in which the 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 important and fundamental changes begin to take place can, can i just yeah, add one more point please, yeah. uh, and a very important feature which takes place after the 16th century is the emergence of bourgeoisie as a very strong powerful class and and uh, it is not a uniform phenomena but uh, territories which were involved in trade there the phenomena of rise of bourgeoisie is quite prominent and for for example in case of england we find a very interesting situation emerging in the 17th century when the bourgeoisie becomes so powerful that it starts challenging the feudal state and and from that period after the civil war we find the process of parliamentary democracy emerging a similar kind of conflict takes place in france in the late 18th century so every state has its own stage of development it is different from the other but at the same time the uh, the political structure is greatly determined by the changes taking place at the economic level and at the social level so that means uh, uh, as you must have noticed time and again the economic factor is coming as one of the main points through which this process of transition takes place the changes in the economy what are these changes what was happening from medieval period to modern period which shaped all the polity and society and these changes are fundamental as dr sena said of uh, transition so let us focus on that that what is happening at the economic front say for example in terms of the mode of production in terms of the trading and commercial activities what uh, what changes have taken place is it just growth of the trade and volumes of production increased which is shaping this or something beyond that dr so, uh, i find uh, that uh, it, it's a very interesting phenomena that it's not necessary that a state which is uh, central which is politically centralized must have economic development first it should not be in that sequence for example italy was a very uh, decentralized state it had uh, different uh, city state system which every city was fighting with the other and political authority was completely decentralized and yet economic development was taking place in capitalist lines first in italy and then it developed in other regions and banking and all for the first yeah. time yeah. style so so italy led the way in commerce because i must point out the difference between commerce and trade trade is basically an exchange of goods and commodities and services whereas commerce is the management part of the trade so the development in trade is not sufficient as the trade was growing at such a rapid speed from the 15th century onwards that there had to be a change in the management of the trade and this is what came about with the emergence of commercial institutions for example insurance began to develop in italy in the early part 1503 is the first insurance company which started in italy then we have uh, insurance of uh, 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 trading goods from one place to another then fire insurance and various kinds of insurance companies emerged similarly the double entry system single entry system they they developed into a full scale system they in fact were developing from the 13th century onwards but by 15th century they take a definite form then we also notice the scale of organization organization of companies the commenda societas these were the form of organizations in italy which ultimately were picked up by rest of european countries which encouraged trade and we find that in holland and in england trading companies the so called chartered trading companies developed 
and from there uh, East India Company and uh, uh, the French East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, these were the companies uh, which emerged and the peculiar part is that these companies were based now on not on individual partnerships, not on, fr on family partnerships but on public investments. And so the difference between trade and, uh, and companies became very marked by the 17th century. Then you have the coming of the stock exchange in, in 1709. This was the first major stock exchange in uh, Amsterdam and many other countries followed the same method. What was the need of the stock, stock exchange? It was to handle the finances which were needed to carry out such a magnitude of trade. Uh, at trading level, we also find that the, um, there was an improvement of technology of shipbuilding uh, from Italy. It, uh, it was the, whole, the Dutch people who developed it and they became the cruisers of trade. They, they had ships which were only meant for carrying goods, which was hired by various countries. And so a very professional form of trading activities emerged from the 16th century onwards or from the late 15th century onwards. And by 18th century we find that trade was rendering so much of profit that this profit was now gradually being invested into industrial sector. And so we find that, the, that a process of division of labor emerging from the process of trade we move on to manufacturing side, certain areas specializing, regional specialization develops in the 16th century, Baltic region specialized in only uh, sale of cereal production, uh, cereal pr produce. Uh, Italy and South European countries, they specialized in wine and in uh, uh, other kind of olive oil and other kind of semi-finished products. So the coming of trade in fact they changed the entire process of development from southern Europe to western Europe. Southern Europe which was the most advanced region now fell into periphery because Mediterranean region was no more the trading center and the trading belt shifted to Atlantic coast and as a result England, Holland, France these were the countries they ultimately gained after the initial advantages given to Portuguese and the Spaniards. So the, it is the trade route which in fact played a very significant part in shifting or in, in uh, having its bearing on the economic development of the region. And, and the regions which were strongly feudal in, by the 15th century, they were emerging into a very powerful industrial powers by the end of the 18th century because of the role of the trade. So that mm. is uh, what uh, Dr. Sinha you mean is certain new commercial practices were coming mm -hmm. into that like uh, banking, like insurance and like stock exchange mm -hmm. companies. These new commercial practices were giving a, a momentum to trade and all and certain volume of trade and the overseas trade mm -hmm. of uh, total volume was also increasing. So, I so would like to add one more point and that is it is the trade ultimately which led to the establishment of early colonial empires. So, so, so the entire process of subjugating certain territories which were uh, economically backward or which were scientifically backward under the European rule and this lasted for four, five centuries, four centuries and, and, and so the division between advanced uh, parts of the world and backward regions or the so-called developed countries and undeveloped countries in fact be, can be traced to this particular period of 16th century. Mishra, would you yeah. like to add something? Yeah, quickly, just two things. On this question of, uh, uh, let us say, uh, a, a rotation of initiative from one power to the other in Europe, so from Italy to Holland and from there to the Atlantic countries of, you know, Spain, Portugal, England and, uh, and France. Is there a kind of a pattern? Is there, can, can we draw some kind of a pattern, some kind of a reason why this, uh, what is the trajectory of this type of initiative? And I think I just want to make two points. Maybe we can look upon the entire developments from the 16th century onwards. We can, this 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 trajectory of modern economic development if we could let's say divide it into two phases the 16th to the 18th century and 18th century onwards 
and let us say we like we can if we can tentatively give them names if we can say 16 to 18th century is a period of modernization which creates the preconditions for the next phase which may be called the phase of industrialization then what are the leaders and what are the principal activities which are happening in this phase in modernization for instance we witness a very high division of labor as uh, 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 dr sinha pointed out we also witness a certain pre-scientific technology. Technologies not of the kind that emerged from 18th century, but different, uh, somewhat primitive level of technologies, but technologies which play a very, very important role uh, in, in the realm of shipping, gunpowder, compass, um, uh, printing now they play a very very Im they become important motors of economic development by facilitating the overseas trade and a kind of a good responsible government because lot of these companies which are undertaking which are indulging in trade overseas trade commerce they are being g provided guarantee and they are being protected by their governments under the notion that this is a task which should be taken up by the government now, an entirely different set of factors emerged from the 18th century onwards, which I would like to call industrialization. This is the takeoff period. And the leader, the initiator, the initiator country of this phase is obviously England. Why it happens in England and not in other countries, not in Holland, for instance, or not in some of the early trading countries is an important question, and we may not have time to go into it, but maybe sometime later. Initial takeoff use of inanimate energy coal now which in gives england a great advantage and finally the application of science and technology to the production process in uh, textile industries and gradually in all kinds of new and old industries the application of science and technology which impart tremendous potentials tremendous powers tremendous productive and regenerative capacities to these industries there are these are two phases there are initiative rests with different powers how this initiative is transferred from from one power to the other is a very very interesting story but we do not have the time to go into it because i think because we have to cover about we have some to cover about society that's right that's right what yeah. changes yes, yes. Uh, now we are running short of time still we have to cover one important aspect at least that is what is how the uh, transition in religion governing the lives of people, religion being the main motivating and more main governing force was giving place to secular and rational thinking and attitudes and how that was taking place. I would request Dr. Sinha to throw some light on that in society and religious history. Yeah, as I told you right in the beginning that uh, the medieval, medieval society was uh, greatly dominated by two pillars. One was the uh, feudal structure and the other one was the Catholic religion. Now by six, the late 15th, early 16th century we find that uh, a dissent, uh, dissenting voice was emerging in various sections of the society and the most important region which was uh, in from that context was Germany which had two extremes. One extreme was the feudal structure which was very powerful, very dominant at the same time because of the presence of mines and because of the presence of the bourgeoisie this was also a reasonably advanced region where the mining was carried out at 300 meters below this uh, land level so it, it reflected both the elements out there and no wonder that uh, the initial uh, rejection of the existing religion uh, took place from there uh, uh, like feudalism, even religion was facing crisis of income. It was facing crisis because uh, because of the declining population, because of so many other factors. And so, in order to compensate that uh, that decline of income, they adopted so many other methods of uh, seeking people's contribution or increasing their revenues that they became extremely unpopular and it is in this context that uh, one can place uh, Martin Luther's revolt against the papal authority which led to a split uh, of religion and now this split of religion in fact was not simply the product of one individual it was the numerous factors, economic factors played a very significant part. This, the, the coming of renaissance which created a new mentality, a more secular mentality, its belief in nature, 
and and uh, the replacement of man by abstract things the importance given to humanism the spread of humanism in northern europe which was called christian humanism and the civic humanism which was there in italy all these factors and and the role of printing press uh, in dissemination of knowledge in dissemination of new ideas and these factors in fact created a climate in which everything was no more to be accepted in a very straight forward as a dictate as a dogma of the church and and, and then the education also uh, the, yeah, the, the, the printing press and uh, all the education uh, also comes out of the university the, realm of, uh, yeah, the, the coming church. Of, uh, the development of universities at various places for example in germany the universities became chief centers of the spread of humanism and they were the chief uh, they were the most important centers who rejected the scholasticism which in fact gave religion a very abstract character so so all these factors in fact created a scientific outlook and then we have a series of reformers like calvin zwingli john knox at different places uh, and and it is not a very unique phenomena only confined to europe we have a similar kind of reform or religious movements taking place earlier or later in asia and in uh, uh, different worlds and and uh, the ex religious exploitation which was now intensified in the new world that was also been resisted so all these factors in fact contributed to a new social climate in which religion was losing its old authority and religion had to be more scientific in order to uh, to win the acceptance of the population which calvin did calvin provided the scientific uh, character of religion yeah, yeah, that, that means now it has linkages with trade also because it was felt okay. that religion is working as an obstacle yes, in the yes, free growth yes. of the trade and all and uh, that is why the debate about usury and yeah, charging exactly, interest exactly. came uh, in the catholic yeah, the bourgeoisie had earned their monies uh, from trade and they did not want to give away the money <laughs> so easily to the church authority <laughs> for them the money was to be used for greater production for greater profit and they did not believe in the concept of donations or uh, just being snatched by the church authorities so they also uh, developed an attitude of resistance towards the church authorities and that uh. means it was not a smooth uh, no it wasn't it was transition uh, yeah. it was resisted uh, it by was the church uh. and uh, mm. they they adopted mm. all in fact recently there has been not recently but for quite some time there has been a debate among scholars including sociologists and uh, historians and economists whether the protestant ethics the coming of the new religion contributed to the spirit of capitalism and max weber and so many other r h tony and so many others have contributed to this debate saying and the general consensus is that the that uh, if not contributing directly the protestant religion had to mold itself according to the capitalist spirit so that it get, gets wider acceptance in european society thank you dr sena now dear viewers we didn't receive any questions from you that was a bit disappointing but uh, we have time limitation and uh, today discussion will take it beyond this point and go further into the discussion and some other time today what you we benefited from the discussion with dr sena is that we could clearly try to have a, a discussion on the transition taking place from medieval world to modern what were these main spheres in which this transition was taking place you saw through in political sphere in economic sphere in social sphere and top of uh, within the social so much transformation was taking place so much changes were taking place in the uh, realm of religion that altogether new thinking and new attitudes were coming so if we see in a nutshell the major transition was taking place due to economy and it was connected with society and political structures and the whole transformation or transition takes place with europe as at its center this process uh, uh, reaches different regions of the world gradually but uh, no doubt about it that europe was the center of this transition and it had 
its impact on other regions gradually. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks to our experts, Dr. Sena and Dr. Mishra. Goodbye and good night. Thank you.